Welcome to the Hockey Writers Maple Leafs Lounge, a weekly show from our Toronto Maple Leafs writing crew, bringing you the latest news, rumors, trades, player grades, prospects, and much more. From training camp to the playoffs, from draft day to the trade deadline, our team covers everything that happens with the blue and white. Come on in and pull up a chair. Welcome to the Maple Leafs Lounge. Hello and welcome back to the Maple Leafs Lounge. I am your host, Peter Barracchini. As always, I'm joined by my colleagues and fellow Maple Leaf writers over at the Hockey Writers, Alex Hobson and Shane Sini. Boys, we got some big news to talk about today. Literally about five to six hours ago, Kyle Dubas is at it once again, just like the Ryan O'Reilly trade. Big blockbuster deal right now to make this team go over the edge or over the top with the playoff in, playoffs insight. But before we get to that, Alex, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, it was it was nice to uh, nice of Dubas to give us a week to recover from the the ROR <laughs> trade before shell shocking us again. And uh, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, I don't really have anything else to say besides my thoughts on the trade. So I'll pass it off to Shane. <laughs> Okay, exactly. I'll take it. Yeah, Shane, <laughs> how 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 are you? How are you doing on this fine Monday? You know what? Doing outstanding. It's just <laughs> it's know. it's just awesome. Life is good. <laughs> I just spent the last hour in the hot tub, so I am uh, I'm ready to go here, boys. I'm ready to go. Then let's get right into it. But before we do, we got to do a little house. Keeping with our little with our sponsor, this episode is brought to you by Hockeypedia. Have you ever been looking for details on a team's player list? The Maple Leafs is always changing with these trades. Do you want to know the Maple Leafs Stanley Cup history? Let's hope that it ends this year. Who is in the 2015 Stanley Cup playoffs? What are the NHL awards and their history? If you're interested in these or any other hockey questions, make sure you check out and bookmark the Hockey Writers Hockeypedia page an ever-growing collection of hockey resources that is invaluable to any fan looking for information. Look for a link in the show description and dive in today. As we mentioned at the top of the show, the Maple Leafs made a big-time deal once again. We didn't think that they could top off the Ryan O'Reilly trade, but here we go. They did, and with moves coming from the Boston Bruins and, T- and Tampa Bay giving a absolutely ridiculous amount for a third-line player, Maple Leafs responded back. They have acquired from the Chicago Blackhawks, Jake McCabe, Sam Lafferty, and two conditional fifth round picks in both 2024 and 2025. And the, and Chicago gets a conditional 2025 first round pick. I believe that is top 10 protected 2026 second round pick along with players Joey Anderson and Pavel Goglev. And the main thing, again, with this trade is that I take from this, no top prospects given to the opposition or to the team that needs them. Picks are the big thing right now. Um, Alex, I'm going to start off with you right now because you uh, did a really great reaction piece to this trade. What are your initial thoughts of this? Uh, initial thoughts can't be anything besides Dubas is going all in. That's that, that's really the only takeaway you can have right now. Um, if you look back to the trade deadlines that he's had with this era of the Leafs, he's always made moves to fill holes on the team, but he's never gone all out to just give them the best roster possible. Like he has this year. And maybe that's a testament to the players that are available this year, as opposed to other years, but Either way, I mean, if you heard him talk in the press conference today, he clearly feels like his team deserves all the moves today. And I think they do too. I think they've tightened up a lot defensively this year. I think that the whole team is playing better defense as a whole. And I've noticed that there have been a lot less of those games where they take their foot off the gas or they forget to show up in the first period. Like it it still happens from time to time, but it's not nearly as frequent as it has been in the past. So, I mean, it's a great trade. I, you know, I talked about it with Matt this morning on on uh, doing a little quick uh, trade reaction video. And after these moves, when you see that they get McCabe, who's a top four defenseman, and Lafferty, who's another good bottom six forward, Leafs deadline is starting to look a lot like the Colorado Avalanche's deadline, where they go after a middle six winger. Obviously, O'Reilly's a little better than uh, Arturi Lekkinen, but he performed like a star in the playoffs. Uh, they get their top four D in, in uh, McCabe, just like the Avs did with Manson, and then your bottom six forwards in Achari and Lafferty. Colorado did so with Nico Sturm and Andrew Cogliano. So I, I think that you have to wonder if maybe Dubas was looking at what Colorado 
Colorado did last year and wanted to sort of emulate it. But bottom line is great trade. I I, I don't think I, I was saying earlier today on Twitter, I don't think the Leafs should be afraid to part with assets and, and, and part with these futures and stuff, because let's face it. One thing matters this year, and that's and that's not just winning around, but it's continued success in the playoffs. And Dubas is clearly on board with it. Shane, as Alex mentioned, you know he's going all in. We saw that with the O'Reilly trade, and now with this, they were always ever since that trade happened, there was talk of them adding a defenseman. Whether it is, it was well, ultimately was McCabe, but also Nick Jensen. You know, there's also Luke Shen, still a possibility. We'll get to that later on. But your make of this deal and how deep this makes this team right now, especially on the blue line where, you know, still some uncertainty and they wanted to get a big marquee name where you didn't really see this. You would only see one trade from Dubas, but now he has two big deadline deals. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love what he's up to. Um, what, I, what really stands out to me the most is with both trades, O'Reilly, Achari, McCabe, and Lafferty, all defensive-minded players. Mm-hmm. Of course, a defensive defenseman is is going to think that way, but that's a huge emphasis, this trade deadline, and I, I love it because the offense is there. It's not going anywhere. The top two lines can compete with absolutely anybody, and they're going to need to compete with the Tampa Bay Lightning. So I love how he's really shifted his focus to getting some defensively sound players. And at the end of the day, like this group – now on the blue line, there's going to be some questions on who plays because right now it's quite crowded and they could be adding somebody else, which we'll get to. But yeah, the lots of uh, lots of tinkering for Sheldon Keefe, which is great, especially on a back to back this week and awesome for them to pull these these trades off as they're going on a five game road trip. No, nothing better than getting to know the guys and being around them and and, you know, that team bonding. So they're going to jump right in and look for Lafferty and McCabe to play on uh, on Wednesday against the Oilers. It's not just team bonding right now. They're going to see Springsteen. Tomorrow. I heard sure. going to the so, boss. That's a, that, <laughs> that's a pretty that's a pretty big team bonding experience to get you uh, affiliated with your new team. Exactly. If you, think, if you think about it, that is the perfect team bonding moment because hey, what better than to go to a rock show with one of the best you know rockers out there? So hey, really excited for them. I hope they enjoy that show because I'm pretty pretty sure it would be a great one. But like you mentioned, Shane. Um, the defense, the the defensive minded presence that he got with all these players. But the big thing is as well in, in regards to that is getting offense from the defense. We know how much of a transitional player with Jake McCabe is with his breakouts, how he's very good in that aspect and making that strong first breakout pass, something we haven't seen with some other defenders. I'm just going to leave it right there. Sam Lafferty having the speed and ability to get in on the four check. Uh, he, I believe he's had a couple shorthanded goals this season as well. So both players are making an impact from defense in transitioning into offense and putting points on the board as well. Obviously you're not going to see big production from them because they are on a team that's closer to the end or the lower end of the standings. But for Jake McCabe to be a plus seven on that team, um, you know, have 122 hits, 115 block shots. That is huge. And even Sam Lafferty um, having, uh, I believe he has 94 hits as well, 21 block shots, but he's still physical as well. So you have that defense from offense, physicality, and a couple of things that Dubas pointed out in his press conference, and he reiterated all these key terms with the acquisitions that he got today. Competitiveness, energy, speed, versatility, physicality. These are the types of pre- players and the mindset that you want when you go on a deep run. And we're going to get to that later on. But now let's try and break down what each player brings to this squad. And Shane, I'm going to start off with you this time with Jake McCabe. Um, You know, obviously it's huge considering the fact that Jake Muzzin went on LTIR um, or he or his season's basically shut down and they needed someone to replace that kind of player. Is this the best alternative or best replacement option for this team? Yes, 100 percent. And at two million dollars on the cap, even better. Right. So great work there to get them to retain some salary because he's on contract for the next through the next two seasons. So um, he's a top four guy. He can play top pair minutes. He doesn't play much on the power play, but he's a great penalty killer. But as far as the offense goes, he can snap that first pass. And when Mm -hmm. you got, you know, 
Tavares flying down the wing, which we never thought we'd say. Um, and you got guys like, you know, Marner that just need the puck. Those guys get them the puck. And uh, it's going to be simple for him. So the fact that he brings a, an element of toughness, which they need more of on the back end, uh, which will be great. But he's versatile. He he does it all. He's he's absolutely the perfect fit here. Um, and that he's getting paid $2 million on the books for the Leafs. All those people that say that they can't afford this guy, that guy, and the other guy. Well, <laughs> look what look what Dubas did again. So we're paying Ryan O'Reilly 1.8. We're paying you know, Jake McCabe, 2 million. And I'm saying that like I'm on the team, but it's pretty awesome to see. And as a Leaf fan through and through, I love it. Absolutely. It's, com- love it. it's coming right out of your pocket, eh, Shane? Right. Exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. Very, and the big thing was they needed to pay up a first round in order for tal- salary to be retained. That was a big thing. So we expected if anything was going to happen, a first round pick would be going the other way. Um, Alex, we we already talked about like his ability to come into the lineup and be that replacement. Um, do was during the press conference also mentioned, you know, the lack of playoff experience from McCabe considering how he's been with Buffalo. He's been with Chicago who hasn't seen a, you know, any playoff experience whatsoever. He, even though he hasn't played a game, he does feel like the type of player that would thrive and, you know, just put his best foot forward in that situation regardless. Yeah, uh, and it's funny you mentioned that, actually, because I am I was in the midst of pulling up a tweet from Mark Lazarus about Jake McCabe, and I scrolled past an article that he wrote a while back, and uh, the caption of it is, I've, it's a quote from him, he's like, I've lost a lot in this league, and it's getting pretty old, so... This guy's Similar chomping at to the what bit. Ryan O'Reilly said in, with uh, Buffalo back then. He's chomping at the bit. He wants to get mm-hmm. into the postseason. Um, but the, the tweet that I was looking for was, it goes like this. Jake McCabe, oh, whoops, my bad. At five on five, the Blackhawks have outscored opponents 41 to 39 with Jake McCabe on the ice. And the Blackhawks have a minus 53 goal differential at five on five. Makes you think. Uh, so that tells you a lot about Jake McCabe's game and how much they relied on him in Chicago. I think that defense, him being there is the only reason that defense is is bottom 10 in the league and not bottom five or bottom three. So, yeah, uh, obviously a huge acquisition. And you're right, McCabe does feel like that type of player that's going to that's gonna eat those minutes up in the playoffs. You know, we're talking about a guy that, that the Leafs should be targeting to clear out the front of the net. McCabe will do just that. He can throw an absolutely booming hit. I don't know if you guys remember his his hit on Line a, a couple of years back, mm-hmm. uh, right when he got mm-hmm. into the league. That was, of course, when he was with the Sabers and Line a was with the Jets. But um, you know, he's he's just so solid defensively. He's going to fill such a big gap on that penalty kill. And you know, for a Leafs team this year that is already, I, I think they're like sixth in the league and in, in goals against. For a team that's already pretty good defensively, the number one concern was not having or, or trying to find a situation where one of, or ideally both of Mark Giordano and Justin Hall are not playing top four minutes in the playoffs. And by making this trade, I think you up you up those odds immediately. So hmm. um, it it's going to be interesting to see how Keefe deploys Jake McCabe. I think I, I wouldn't be surprised to see him play alongside someone like Rasmus Sandin. Maybe I think that's a pretty solid, sh- uh, I won't say shutdown pair. It'll let, Sandine carry the puck a little more maybe but overall I think that it was absolutely a necessary move for them to make and not not necessarily because they needed a defensive upgrade but because they could really use one so just going to jump in quick also mm-hmm. in regards to the uh the no playoff games Dubas called Ron Hainsey who also had no playoff games before he was acquired by the Leafs just to get his sense on you know what the adjustment was like and you know all the all the fine things the small small details that's why the mm-hmm. Maple Leafs are the Maple Leafs because they take care of their players and they worry about the small details so it was awesome to hear that in the press conference today and honestly because of McCabe's style like we said he's perfect for the playoffs Maple Leafs and Dubas always doing their homework and it's funny that you brought up those uh, numbers from Mark Lazarus's uh, Twitter account Alex because looking at natural stat trick with a minimum of 350 minutes played he leads all Chicago Blackhawks players in course of four percentage with four, 46.73%. Sam Lafferty, right? Not too far behind him at 46.44%. Has the best or the second best um, goals for percentage at 51.25. But what really astonishes me is the high danger goals for 23 to 17 for 57% from a defenseman on a Hawks team that is 
bleeding offense right now that has struggled to put the puck in the net. And he's always a, a factor on the ice when that happens. So not just defense, he can chip in offensively and can find that as, or, you know, get into that groove offensively from time to time. So, you know, don't count out that game of his just yet because it is very effective. As we, we already delved uh, in depth with McCabe, but now let's go to Lafferty right now. And Alex, you know, you similar to what, um, what you said about uh, the McCabe hit, of a booming one on Patrick Laine. Lafferty is no stranger to being physical as well, because there's also a clip online of him getting into the corner. Uh, Hunter, uh, the Twitter account, Hunter Crowther posted this, and it's him going into the corner, laying a hit, getting to the front of the net, and then tipping a goal by said player, Jake McCabe, who assisted on that, apparently. Um, is We always talk about death players being very critical and finding the score sheet in the playoffs. Is Lafferty the equivalent to... What, um, you know, kind of like what Lars Eller and Devontae smith Pelly were for the Washington Capitals uh, when they won the Cup. What Nick Paul and, you know, not necessarily Brandon Hagel, but because he was Colton. in that. Ross Colton. I, I, I'll throw in Hagel in there because he was going up and down between the top six and third line as well. Is he that kind of that player similar to a Charlie that can push them over the top right now? Absolutely. I think he is. And I think the main thing that that in, that sort of intrigues me about what the Leafs are doing at their bottom six is they're totally reshaping the identity, the identity of it. And that's no secret. We've talked about how they've been leaning to do that. We talked about it when they traded for Achari last week. Um, the, ide- the identity of their bottom six in years past has mostly been puck possession and strong defensive players with not really any emphasis on physicality or, or, really just physicality. I mean, so you, you you look at what they're doing this year and by adding Achari and Lafferty, what you're doing is you're ensuring that if these players get silenced offensively, they're not going to get silenced physically. And I think that's the main thing that makes their bottom six a lot more enticing. And a thing that makes that that's going to make their bottom six a lot harder to play against this year is if they get, if, if they get shut up and they're not able to score goals and they go quiet offensively in the series, when that happened last year, we didn't see Alex Kerfoot going out there and throwing the body. And we didn't see Pierre Engvall doing that. I think that with the bottom six forwards they've got right now, their game is going to be exclusively focused on just having those physical guys who can go and just, just make you intimidated when you're on the ice. Just, just, just let them know that they're not going to be able to skate all over you. They're not going to be able to have all this time and space to make these plays. Like they're good defensive players, but they're also not afraid to give you a little body check and show you who's boss. So I think that that's the big thing is reshaping the identity of that bottom six. If you look back to cup winners in recent years, almost every team has had a bottom six to the effect of this. So I think that it's uh, it, it was about time for Kyle Dubas to venture in this direction. Yeah, it definitely. Um, Shane, mm-hmm. Sam Lafferty is 6'1", 195 pounds. Obviously, you know, when the Tampa Bay Lightning acquired Tanner Janot, um, you know, everyone thought that, oh, here we go. Tampa Bay's loading up on physicality as opposed to offense, even though Janot can kind of get that aspect back if he is in a top six role, but he is having a down year. Is this the equivalent to matching that type of move that Tampa made, but still a little bit of a better price tag with uh, Lafferty compared to Janot? I think Dubas makes this trade regardless of if Tampa acquires Janot or not. Um, just because Lafferty's versatility, and for mm-hmm. a lot of Maple Leafs fans that don't really know him that well, think Colin Blackwell on steroids. Yeah, because he's he's speedy. and Colin Blackwell was very speedy last year too. Right, very fast, and he loves to finish a check. He's versatile. He can play down the middle or on the wing. And look, they're healthy right now, but that might not be the case come the middle of April. So they got to worry about who can play down the middle and who can play the wing. And he can play all over the lineup. So I love how he's you know tied for the league league in uh, shorthanded goals. And he's just going to elevate the the power or the penalty kill, sorry, even more. So when it comes to those playoff games, those one goal games, like special teams is huge. So, um, you know, now that we have Achari, O'Reilly, Lafferty, we already got, they got camp. Like, it's crazy. It's crazy. The bottom six is just think about like Joey Anderson and who else has been there? Pontus Holmberg. No, you know, no disrespect to him, but 
they've elevated this bottom six and mm-hmm. you know what it sounds like they're probably done with the forward group but that's what he said on the, the last press conference so <laughs> um who knows who knows there's a lot of time between monday night at seven and uh and friday at three yeah uh, but- another thing i wanted to mention as well if you re- if you go into dubas's press conference today he mentions that this trade was pretty much already across the finish line by the time the Janot trade was announced. So I think that perfectly sort of reaffirms the notion that he didn't go out and do this to retaliate against Tampa. He had this, he had this idea to bo- upgrade the bottom six and uh, upgrade their defense already. And two, the Lafferty signed next year, 1.15. We got, you know, McCabe's on the books for two more years at two mil, like, which uh, we've kind of hit home a few times here, but mm-hmm. it's not just a, a deal for this year. It's a, it's a deal for, for next year and with McCabe the year after. So obviously loading up and sending away a bunch of picks and a couple of prospects, but end of the day, it's good for the run for this year and hopefully for next year too. Absolutely. And the fact that they are signed, you know, for a few more seasons after that is critical and, Absolutely. This is, this is huge for the Maple Leafs right now, considering, and yeah, it, it, everything seemed to be in place before the Geno deal happened. It was just a very, very happy coincidence. Let's call it that it happened before the Maple Leafs announced this deal or a day later. So there was always that whole notion of what came first, kind of the chicken or the egg, what came first, the Geno deal or the McCabe deal. But let's, you know, let's just say that the McCabe, McCabe and Lafferty deal happened before Geno. That'll make us feel a little bit better. Right. Yeah, I'm in. That's too- <laughs> I'm just happy either way. There we I, go. I can't stop thinking about Lafferty Daniel next to the T, <laughs> right? So nice Happy Gilmore reference for anybody out there that cares. Exactly. And if you haven't watched Happy Gilmore, go ahead and watch it. But before we get into the second half, let's do another sponsor read right now. This show is brought to you by Sports Fan Side Hustle a new digital course that teaches passionate sports fans how to make a lucrative side income off of their love of the game. Get off the sidelines and into the game with a course that will teach you more than 14 different and easy to start methods. Any sports fan, even ones with little to no experience in writing, podcasting, video production, or marketing can use to make a steady part-time or full-time income. All you need is the internet, a computer, a passion for sports, and a few hours a week. Go to sportssidehustle.com to get the absolutely free startup guide that will explain four keys to unlocking this income opportunity. Again, that's sportssidehustle.com and get started today. As we were talking a little bit before uh, the end of the first half, we were talking about, you know, contracts with uh, Lafferty and McCabe, but it gives the Maple Leafs plenty of options uh, with their lineup. Obviously McCabe can play both left and right side. Lafferty can play every single forward position right now. So what does this do for Sheldon Keefe right now with the combinations that he possibly can have? And depending if a move happens, you know, it, it is it, the Maple Leafs are definitely going to be in a good spot. Alex, what do you do? You envy Sheldon Keefe right now, similar to the whole O'Reilly Achari thing right now. What What do you think is the best uh, course of action with McCabe and Lafferty right now? I can't even really begin to predict what lines they'd end up on or how the lineup's going to look until I see what they do with the abundance of forwards and defensemen that they have right now, because they're not going to be moving forward with what they have. They've got Mm -hmm. 13 forwards on the roster. They've got eight defensemen on the roster. Can't imagine they're going to want to waive Connor Timmons after just signing him to an extension. So, you know, you got seven defensemen. Sure, I guess there's the option to roll with seven, but are you really going to be is it, is it really going to be worth it to have Sandine or Hall riding on the bench with the money they're making? I mean, not that Sandine's making that much or Hall for that matter, but um, I just think that it's it, there's never been a clearer time than right now to make a trade. And before, they, uh, before I start thinking about where those guys are going to play, I want to see how that roster shakes out before Friday. And that's why those games on Wednesday and Thursday are so interesting to me because you'd have to imagine – if you ask, sorry, I'll just, I, I, before I go off on too much of a tangent, if you go back to Dubas's press conference today, he said that time was on his side and he, the way that he mentioned it, he made it sound like Murray was going to be activated off LTIR this week. And if he's activated, the Leafs are going to be over the cap and they're going to have to, they're going to have to trade somebody. Mm-hmm. And so 
that's why the games on Wednesday and Thursday are so important to me because, you know, if, if, if nobody gets injured in those two games, I feel like whoever sits those two games is going to be a clear indicator of who's going to get traded because I, if you're not going to want to trade the, you're, you're, you're not going to want to say sit these, you're, you're not going to want to sit guys and then trade them afterwards. Like it, 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 it all depends, I guess, because say for example, like Kerfoot and Hall, um, both guys that I think would be at the front of the line when it comes to, when it comes to being traded. And I just say that because of the money they're making and the roles that they play right now. I can't imagine that the Leafs are going to put those guys in the lineup if they envision a roster without them. And then if they end up being the guys that get traded, then why would you, why would you risk injuring them and in having them get injured in the games? You probably want to put them on the bench. So I think whoever sits in those games on Wednesday and Thursday is going to end up, probably being the ones get traded, but it's going to be interesting to see. Shane, your thoughts on the lineup implications and what Keith can look forward to as possible combinations in regards to McCabe and Lafferty. Yeah. Keith's probably going to stay back at the hotel and skip the concert. Cause he's going to be <laughs> you know, going through the lineup. Cause he's talking about how he couldn't sleep before. And now, <laughs> now he's definitely not getting any sleep. So uh, for me, it's like, you, you just want to figure it out and, and try a few things. You got time here. Like Duba said, they got time on their side. So I think he'll stick with uh, with the top six the way they have it right now. And then Lafferty will probably be, I'm going to guess, on the left wing of that third line. And they'll move Engvall down to the fourth line and hopefully off the team. But that's uh, that's something to, to consider too. But when it comes to D, it's like you have, well, if they go Riley, Brody, McCabe, Lilligren, Giordano, Timmins, or Giordano, Sandine or Hall. So yeah, for me, it's either Timmons, Sandine or, or Hall who are going to sit. But as far as getting traded, then I would probably put Hall and Kerfoot and Engvall into that conversation. Absolutely. And you know, this, I was going to say this for the question after this um, next topic, but because it's tying in right now, let's go and do a little quick fire right now. If you had to pick between Justin Hall, Alex Kerfoot or Pierre Engvall, to move in a subsequent deal to try and clear some cap space or a roster spot, who would you pick? Alex, I'm going to throw it over to you first. Uh, it'd be Alex Kerfoot for me. Um, I just think that with the guys, the specifically the guys that they've added through trades, you've got O'Reilly, who's a center who can contribute offense and kill penalties. He's great. One of the best defensive forwards in the league. You've got Nola Chari, who kills penalties and throws the body. You've got... Sam Lafferty, who kills penalties and throws the body. Kerfoot's role is just completely redundant now. And mm -hmm. I just think that there, it's it'd be a complete waste to have him making 3.5 million on the fourth line when you know you, you've got a, you've got Lafferty who's doing that job for for a third of the money. And really, I mean, if it came down to it, you could use one of the Marlies in that role and they could do the job pretty much as well as Kerfoot. So if it came down to Engvall being traded, I wouldn't hate that either. But I think that Engvall has got a little more offensive upside than Kerfoot does. And he's got better speed. I just think that Kerfoot is a very expensive utility knife right now that they don't need. So if they keep Justin Hall, worst case scenario, I mean, I, I would just hope that Keith doesn't use him the same amount that he does in the past. Now that they've got Jake McCabe, but if it came to that and if he had to, if he had to stay, you know, having him as a seventh defenseman ready to come off the bench to um, kill penalties or whatever, if they had to, isn't the worst scenario in the world. So I'd probably throw my money on Kerfoot there. Shane, who, who are you sending off? It sounds like Kerfoot's the guy um, just based on, you know, I've heard a couple of things as far as maybe sending him out to Vancouver as part of the a Luke Shen trade. So um, do I think that will happen? Probably not. But um, to me, I would I would trade Kerfoot, but I don't know. I, I would do my very best to get Justin Hall out of that lineup. And if it means that he's got to get traded for that to happen, then great. Because honestly, I, I just don't think he's an NHL defenseman. And I've said that more than once. Yeah, you both make good cases. Uh, Alex with Kerfoot, Shane with Hall. Um it, it is a toss up right now. You really don't know what to think. Obviously, Kerfoot seems like the more ideal topic because you get to move on from that $3.5 million contract. It's absolutely mm -hmm. huge because every dollar counts. You can learn, you can live with Justin Hall making $2 million, fine. But as you mentioned, Shane, or as we talked about previously on the show, 
you know, the inconsistencies, the clearing attempts. If you're able to put Riley back with Brody, have McCabe with Timothy Lilligren or put McCabe on the right side and have Sandine there. And then you have Giordano and Timmons or Giordano and Sandine, what have you, you have those extra combinations at your disposal. So that works out in your favor in regards to uh, Engvall. Yeah. You mentioned he's got more offensive upside and more speed, but the big thing is he still can't use his size to his advantage. And that is huge Mm -hmm. considering how much size he has. And there was one goal. I can't remember where, but he, cut off a defender, retained the puck, got to the middle of the ice and scored a beautiful goal. That is the kind of play we want to see Pierre Engvall make with his size and use that to create that separation. So um, in reality, it looks like it's going to be Kerfoot. But at the same time, I do think that if you do need to move on from someone, it could be Justin Hall because at least Engvall does have, have that upside. I think it could be both. Honestly, like why, why, why package would you deal? Do, yeah. Package deal. Uh, I don't know what team would take both of those players on. I mean, to be fair, they are on the last year of their deal, but I don't know. Maybe you're, uh, may, I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's a team out there willing to do that and willing to give up a couple of picks. I mean, Frank Cervalli did say that there's some smoke around Kerfoot in Vancouver. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, there is. And, of course, uh, along with our own insider, Shane Sini, of, yeah, who of I course. trust more <laughs> than Cervalli. <laughs> cervalli has been ripping these guys so, for their moves and, I don't know. Yeah, that's a story for another day. But to me, too, they might be able to slip Hall through waivers. I mean, Possibly. not a lot of guys what a, are. What an ending to the to the Justin Hall's chapter in Toronto would that be, eh? Yeah. Just put on waivers. Just, he gets claimed. He, he gets probably, claimed. But he probably slipped through, to be honest. Not. I mean, mm-hmm. there's there's quite a market for right-handed defensemen. But, I guarantee um, you watch Boston would claim him or something like no, that. Somebody would, for sure. <laughs> I know. But if they It'll could turn into a Norris through, contender. Yeah. And then he haunts them in the playoffs, but, <laughs> um, but no, who knows? It's going to be interesting to see between now and Wednesday night against the Orleans. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And speaking of the Boston Bruins, um, jumping into our last topic, which would have been our second last, but I just said, I decided to change things on the spot on the show because I felt like it, but um Obviously, the whole entire talk is going to be around Toronto, Tampa Bay, because that seems to be the matchup right now. It's it, it, it was like that in December, and it just got solidified that in January based on everything has been playing out. Based on this move right now, whether you want to talk about even the O'Reilly and Achari one or this one, does this move solidify the aspect or the notion that this team is ready to compete and give Tampa Bay or even the knock off Tampa Bay because they were in that spot last season and it just kind of fell off the rails. Are they ready again to beat Tampa Bay as well as what's beyond Tampa Bay? Should they win with the boss of Bruins with Carolina, New Jersey, New York, who they could face in the conference finals. Shane, what do you think? It helps. It definitely helps. But at the end of the day, it's coming down to goaltending mm-hmm. and I I worry a little bit about that still because, I mean, Samsonov's been really good. He's been awesome. And if he doesn't show up in the playoffs, then there's big problems. And we're going to see how Matt Murray comes back from his latest injury because you just can't trust the guy to stay healthy. So they're set up defensively, offensively. They they match up nice. Their special teams matches up nice. End of the day for me, it's still goaltending. Alex, what do you think? Is goaltending still the big X factor or possibly the only X factor this time because they match out so evenly? And even so, looking back at last year's results, they managed to get three goals every single time on Andre Vasilevsky, except for that crucial game seven where he was just lights out. Are they ready for that? And what's uh, beyond? Yeah, I mean... Like Shane said, I think it'll come down to goaltending in the first round. I think the thing to remember is that they don't need carry price level goaltending. They just need good enough goaltending. And the biggest thing is if if they have 9-10 goaltending or something to the effect of that throughout the first round or throughout however long they're in the playoffs, that's fine. Because I'd rather have a guy making, or I'd rather have a guy with a 910 save percentage who just keeps the team in the game than a guy who puts up a 920 save percentage and allows a back breaking goal at the worst time. I think that's another thing is that he needs to be a timely goalie and he's got to make these timely saves. And I've said it a million times before. When this team gets over the first round hump, I really don't think there's a single team in their way that they that that they couldn't beat. And you know, it, 
I don't think Dubas makes these moves if he doesn't have confidence in his team beating Tampa in a, in a playoff series, beating Boston in a playoff series, beating Carolina, beating all these teams that you mentioned. Um, it's the deepest Leafs team we've ever seen, in, or at, at least in the Matthews era. And I don't think Dubas makes these moves if he's if he thinks if he thinks that the team is going to stop after winning one round. I think you know you make these moves, you're in it for the long haul. So I do think that they're ready for what's after Tampa Bay. It definitely is going to be fun and probably the most anticipated playoffs of anything. Like you said, Alex, during the Matthews era, because this is the deepest team we have seen. And these moves just vaulted them to possibly the top of, you know, finally dethroning a dynasty with what Tampa Bay has done so far. Um, Giving the Bruins a run for the money because there have been times where they have been competitive against them this season. So Definitely entertaining or or interesting and entertaining to say the least of down the stretch and what lies ahead because it is very possible where they may be the underdog, but people are still going to count them, count them out because of history, but this could work to their advantage as well. So that'll be a big time thing. It's going to be exciting. Absolutely. And that is all that we have for this episode of the Maple Leafs Lounge. Thank you for tuning in as we broke down the Jake McCabe and Sam Lafferty trade. Um, Obviously we want to, again, thank you for tuning in. That's all that we have for this moment. Be sure to check out Hockeypedia and sports, sports side hustle. Uh, Everything is going to be in the description below. Um, Again, that is it for this episode for Alex Hobson and Shane Sini. I'm Peter Barracchini and we'll see you next time on the Maple Leafs lounge.